everyone. Uh, as Flo said, I'm a product manager at Instacart in our emerging products team. And today I want to talk to you about how we're using geospatial tools to accelerate growth. Um, in consumer tech, you'll sometimes hear you know, seemingly hacky kind of short-term approaches to really juice growth, referred to as growth hacking. Uh, so I like to think of what we're doing as growth mapping when I'm feeling punny. Uh, so first some basics, what is Instacart? Uh, we're a grocery delivery company and we are the largest in North America. And the way that we deliver groceries is by partnering with local retailers, local grocers. Um, we ourselves do not maintain any warehouses or inventory, so we work with them. We digitize their catalogs and get it online so that you, the customer, can go onto our website, our app, or even retailer-maintained apps that we support, place your order, and then we connect you with a personal shopper who goes and picks and delivers your groceries. Emerging Products, my team, uh, spans a few different domains, um, all geared towards kind of pushing and expanding our business models. Um, what that means in practice is coverage expansions, uh, extending who and where we serve, as well as category expansions. Uh, grocers increasingly sell a lot more than just groceries, um, in some states, a lot of alcohol or pharmacies, catering, uh, and we want to be able to deliver all of those things to you. Uh, and there's actually geospatial elements to both of these, but today I'll focus on geographic expansion. So when Instacart wants to expand, there are a couple dimensions to it. First, we actually have to make the service live to your address, and we usually think about it at like a zip code level. Uh, so over the past seven years, we have you know, steadily turned uh, North America green. We're available in basically every single zip code um, to every household in, North in the US and most of Canada. But like I said, we ourselves don't have any groceries, so it's somewhat meaningless to be live if we don't actually have the groceries to deliver it to you. So in parallel, we've been signing, you know, virtually every grocer in North America. Uh, this is just a subset of those who we've signed over the past seven years. Um, we now have over 300 retailers um, available. Now, where things get interesting, uh, in my view, is the overlay of those two. Creating service areas for those retailers. Um, but historically, we didn't really think about this as a growth opportunity. We were just focused on launching the zips, launching the stores, and we really just thought about this as kind of an efficiency play. Um, more specifically, we would go into a market, let's take New York, and subdivide it into different zones. For example, Lower Manhattan would be a zone in New York. And that would be the geographic entity that we use to match supply and demand. So if you're a customer in Lower Manhattan, you place your order, we will connect you with a shopper in Lower Manhattan. We also use that same entity as the basis for our retailer service areas. So if you're a customer in Lower Manhattan, you can only order from a retailer that's physically in Lower Manhattan, and then we connect you with a shopper in Lower Manhattan. Some of you are probably already starting to sense some limitations or, or challenges with this, with this approach, um, but in fairness, it was a really, really good way to scale super rapidly um, and extend ourselves into every US, you know, major US city um, with multiple retailers. So it made a lot of sense kind of when we were in the early stages of this uh, growth stage. Also, it made a lot of sense when we didn't have as many retail partners, right? So we might only have one or two key partners in New York when we were doing this process, and it was fairly easy to optimize the, those zones and those service areas around them. But about a year ago, my team started looking at this practice, and we saw a few issues with it. One is, as I said, we're now basically in every US zip code. We're also partnered with almost every retailer. And so if we want to sustain the same type of year-over-year -year growth, we need to get more out of that existing footprint. Moreover, as we sign new retailers, those zones and those shared service areas that we created initially may not work for the new array of retailers we have. You know, grocers have very different um, retail footprints in terms of the number and distribution of stores. So what worked really well five years ago probably doesn't work super well now. So today I want to tell you a bit about that, that initiative that we've been on over the past year and the role that geospatial tools have played throughout. 
um, from just upfront sizing the opportunity and confirming that there was really a business case to improve this, to figuring out, okay, once there is a business case, how do we actually go do it? Then visualizing the opportunity to get buy-in and get folks excited. And then finally, once we had done the first three things, actually going ahead and implementing it. So first, just confirming that there was an opportunity here. Um, you know, I think a lot of folks at the company had probably an anecdotal sense that the way we had done this in the past had left some opportunity on the table, but didn't necessarily appreciate the scale of the opportunity. So we very simply took all of the stores we were partnered with um, and used Cardo to uh, generate ISO lines or travel sheds around those stores um, at varying times of day, at varying distances. Um, we then looked at, okay, what zips does that store currently serve? Which ones does it not currently serve? And the ones where it's not currently serving, how many people live there? And how many of them do we think would be likely to try this store if it was enabled, um, based on kind of historic penetration rates that we've seen for the retailer in, in similar markets? The opportunity size that we saw was uh, pretty staggering. Um, across a range of scenarios, we saw that we had actually left a lot of opportunity on the table based on our kind of traditional method of, of developing these service areas. So we had a really big, exciting number. And the next question was, okay, how do we go get that, get that revenue? The first approach we took tried to stick to the existing set of rules. So kind of confined to this idea that we have zones and that retailers in that zone sort of share the service area. We worked with the Cardo team to develop a model that would optimize those zones, um, looking at the zip codes in a given market, um, looking at the centers of those zips, generating an origin destination matrix, looking at the adjacency uh, within that matrix, and then uh, iterating through different cuts to basically see what would be the most efficient way to divide that market um, and allow all of the retailers in that market to serve the maximum number of people. This produced some really interesting results. So this is Pittsburgh, for example, um, after we ran this model. This is not what the Pittsburgh uh, market looks like today for us. If you look at a map of our Pittsburgh zones today, it looks like a person, uh, a very smart person, went and drew it based on eyeballing, okay, where are stores, uh, where are kind of natural clusters and neighborhoods, and you end up with a fairly kind of grid-like pattern. What you see here is obviously a much more radial kind of pizza-shaped design that takes much better advantage of major roadways so that a given zone is actually much more uh, traversable uh, and can be quickly traversed by shoppers given the roadways. So it was very interesting, um, and there were certainly some efficiency benefits there, but this was a growth project. What we saw was even after multiple iterations, Trying to optimize a shared service area only gets you so far. Again, grocers have many different numbers of stores in a, different market, in a given market, um, very different distribution of those stores, and you just weren't able to unlock that many more customers for all of our retailers if you were trying to pool those service areas. So after going through this process, uh, we realized that if we really wanted to seize this opportunity, we would have to pivot to creating custom service areas for each retailer, kind of putting aside this notion of, of zones and, and sort of shared service, which was a, a pretty big pivot uh, for, for the company. So at this point, we had a really compelling business case. We now had clarity on what it would take to go get that business. Uh, we had to get some other folks bought in, though, uh, including kind of internal stakeholders who would green light and resource the project, and also retailers themselves who, you know, at minimum, we don't want them to exercise any veto power over this. Um, but more importantly, we want them to be excited uh, and see kind of the value that Instacart can bring to them. And this is where visualization came in. You know, through what are fairly rudimentary maps uh, to many folks in this room, uh, we were able to actually show what extending service areas would mean for our retailers. Um, many of these folks are just not used to seeing data or business opportunities visualized spatially. And being able to do this um, really helped uh, drive momentum and excitement in the project. Specifically, um, this is an example for one of our Philadelphia retailers, represented by the stars on this map. And the gray are all the zip codes that they could serve prior to this initiative. 
Uh, for those who aren't familiar with Philadelphia, hopefully my Liberty Bell clip art makes clear that the green is all the zip codes we could turn on, which was in kind of the dense urban core of the city. Um, and this uh, kind of helped us make a few cases. One, uh, this retailer sort of knew through their own data and just kind of uh, instinctually that people in downtown Philadelphia were not driving out to their stores. Uh, most you know, urbanites don't have a car, and those who do aren't using it to go grocery shopping. Um, moreover, or sort of related to that, it would made very clear that these would be incremental sales. And I think up until now, Instacart has really been positioned as a convenience play. We're taking transactions that are already happening today offline and bringing them online. Uh, what maps like this helped us prove is that this is actually about creating new transactions, new customers for these retailers, um, and helped us get a lot more buy-in and, and excitement about the project. So now we had a clear business case, clarity on how to do it, and buy-in from the requisite stakeholders, and it's time to actually go do it. Um, and geospatial tools play a really important role here as well. So as you can see, um, we're extending service uh, delivery ranges. We've historically been fairly conservative in our delivery ranges, and what that meant is we didn't have to be too, too smart about knowing where the customer was relative to the store. The range and how far a given customer lived from the store could only be so big because we had been pretty conservative in setting those service areas to begin with. Now that we have much bigger service areas, we have to be a lot smarter about understanding which customers are five minutes away versus which ones are 45 minutes away, and varying our service levels accordingly. Um, so this is something we'll continue to iterate on, but at a very high level, uh, we're now being much more sophisticated in our use of those point locations, um, using a proprietary uh, ML model to generate uh, travel times, both kind of at, at the time of the order, but also in the future, because Instacart allows you to order for you know, up to seven days out, and determining, okay, is this customer short range, mid range, long range, and then varying the type of delivery windows that we provide them accordingly. So, big business opportunity, clarity on how to do it, folks are really excited, we developed the tools internally to go do it. Um, how's it working? Really well so far. Um, so as expected, we're seeing a lot more people try Instacart. For those of you who are the grocery shoppers in your household, I'm guessing that you have one or two that you really like. You don't just roll a dice and choose some random grocer whenever you want to get food. And so if we want to get you to try Instacart, we better have those grocers available to your house. Um, so we're seeing a lot more people try it. Less expectedly, we're seeing higher spend per customer. So let's say you tried Instacart, we had your second favorite grocer, but we now have your first favorite. Um, you're going to spend more because you're really excited about that grocer. And if you're an existing customer, we've seen them start to spend, uh, get more deliveries uh, per month or per week. Because um, now, you know, maybe you get your organic produce from one, your shelf-stable goods from another, and, you know, beverages from a third. And then finally, I think this will be something that we measure more over the long term, but we're seeing evidence of, of stronger relationships, both with our customers and our retailers. So customers, again, are now not just substituting offline transactions for online ones, they're actually able to access entirely new retailers, um, and that makes them value the service more and stick around longer. You know, conversely or similarly for our retailers, they're accessing entirely new pool of customers um, and can thank Instacart for that. So it's been a really exciting year for geospatial analysis at Instacart, um, and thank you for letting me share it with you. <laughs>